Hello and welcome to another episode of Ground Truth. In this episode, we'll be discussing artificial intelligence and specifically large language models and diffusion models. If you're not familiar with large language models or diffusion models, uh, you may have heard of OpenAI's uh, GPT-3, which is a large language model, or DALI-2, which is a diffusion model conditioned on clip image embeddings. Uh, I will not be going into the specifics of these models, but we will be talking about these models uh, and in future models, which will be affecting human society. Recently, we've seen some amazing results from the diffusion models, which turn text into images. In addition to Dolly 2, other competitors such as Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, Google uh, Imogen, and Party, and others, uh, to name a few. Now, they're not all diffusion models. Some of those are autoregressive, but the outputs are very uh, similar. And I'm going to display some of these examples uh, to give you an idea of their quality. And as you'll see, they're amazing. I'm not an artist, and I could never hope to create anything close to as intricate and beautiful as some of these images. It's, it's very exciting uh, to see this technology uh, and the outputs. I know that many of you have been posting videos expressing your enthusiasm. But after the initial excitement wore off... I started to feel a little bit sad, a little bit depressed about this. Now, why would I feel sad? Because we finally democratized art. You know, I no longer have to go to art school. All I have to do now is type in a simple prompt, which takes almost no effort. What we've done is we've commoditized art down to zero, or so close to zero that it, that it won't matter. Shortly, one of these models will be released that will run on a, a home computer with five gigabytes of VRAM. Non-artists love this. Corporations love this. Because as a non-artist, I don't have to hire someone to create my ideas. And corporations are excited because now they don't have to hire artists. Now, this is just 2D art, but very soon it will be 3D models, full motion video, and everything within that space will be commoditized to zero. You can imagine building photoreal movies based on some prompts, or video games in a matter of minutes. If you're an artist, it's an existential crisis because you spent all those years mastering, mastering your craft and now an AI can spit out masterpieces in seconds. And not just one or two, but dozens and eventually hundreds or even thousands of variations. These AIs are built on the backs of those artists. They trained on their art, which took hundreds of years to accumulate. The weights and biases are based on their sweat and tears. The competition for the artist is an AI that has seen every image and trained under every master, including them. And this AI gives away its masterpieces for free. But of course, we know it wasn't truly free. It came at a great cost. That will not be factored into the equation as we celebrate free art. And so from my perspective, we've reached the point of peak art as far as humans are concerned. Now, why is that? Because no humans will be incentivized to be an artist in the future. It's not like chess, where the goal is usually to play other humans. We often have no idea who did the art for a print ad or a commercial. That's never really mattered to us. The artists were mostly in the background. They're anonymous. That this is happening in 2022 is shocking. Not just for me, but for the creators of, of AI. I have a separate link below with some of their comments, which includes their surprise at what these models can do. They didn't predict any of this, and they're not exactly sure how the models work. To some extent, they're a black box. You get the sense that they think it's magic. And some of them are shocked that it's artists who are among the first to be replaced. Because art was supposed to be our last line of defense against the AI. Now, all of us expected the cashiers, taxi cab drivers, and long-haul truck drivers to be replaced by AI. After all, what they're doing is mundane, and anyone could do it. 
It takes no special skills to scan items at Kroger's or Walmart. Or at least that's the thinking. The diffusion model's disruption of the art industry is the canary in the coal mine. I cannot do what these diffusion models are doing as far as it pertains to art. It would take me a lifetime for my skill sets to begin to approach what they're doing in their infancy. And these models will only get better and better until they're superhuman. Now, this isn't mundane drudgery that we were told the artificial intelligences would focus on. This isn't a mindless job. They're just replacing people doing repetitive tasks. They're replacing creative people. And it's not just artists. Programmers were shocked that they're being replaced because large language models can speak all known languages, including Python, JavaScript, C++, and unknown languages that they'll create for their own purposes. Initially, we should all feel some remorse for the artists and the programmers. But the next question is, what makes you so special? More than likely, you're going to be replaced by an AI that doesn't sleep and gets better and more efficient every day, every month, every year. Our conception of the world will change. When masterpieces are commonplace, what is a masterpiece? If everything is a masterpiece, nothing is a masterpiece. Imagine a world where every person you could ever date is a perfect 10 with no flaws. Then what is beauty? We appreciate things now because they're rare and difficult to obtain. Think about diamonds. Diamonds are forever and diamonds are valuable because they're hard to get. Now there are synthetic diamonds, but imagine a computer that could just spit out synthetic diamonds all day for free. What would diamonds be worth, synthetic or not? What AI does is commoditize all of these things to zero. You want a great programmer that is superhuman and can program in every language? No problem. You got it. You want a superhuman artist? No problem. You got it for free. Yes, the benefit will be that we will have more art than we could ever consume. We will have more programs than we could ever have the time to even try out. Now, my weird reaction to all of this is that I want to remain human. I want to recognize beauty for what it is, not for what AI diminishes it to be the lowest common denominator. No matter how aesthetically pleasing it is, the AI art isn't real art. It's a beautiful counterfeit. It's like falling in love with a character in your dreams. When you wake up, there isn't anyone next to you. It was just your imagination. The AI art that we see is a shadow of real artists upon which it was built. It has no soul, no purpose, and no meaning. All it does is answer your prompts. Now, this may not resonate with you yet, but as all the jobs are replaced by an AI who learned everything they know from the mountain of human knowledge that we created and gave to them, then you'll understand. When you join the ranks of those displaced by synthetic intelligences, of our own creation. Are people becoming obsolete? The giant electronic brain has started cogitating at the University of Pennsylvania. It's made a vacuum tube like your radio, and it can add up a column of figures a yard long in a second. It's the world's first electronic computer. Right now, it's solving mathematical problems for the U.S. Army, but who knows, someday a machine like this may check up on your income tax. So imagine the, the human abilities as kind of a landscape with some peaks, which, which, are, which are the things we do well, and some valleys, which are the things we do really, really badly. There are things that we do extremely well, which are things that were important in our survival for, for most of our evolutionary history, things like moving around and socially interacting and, and perceiving the world. And there are things that we have only recently learned how to do, uh, things like general reasoning. An extreme example is arithmetic, where we are very, very, very inefficient. Computers are different. They are universal machines. 
uh, with an efficient program, they can do almost any one of these tasks equally well in, in some abstract uh, informational sense. So the uh, skill of computers can be likened to a water level that's, that's uniform. The water level is rising. <laughs> And it's rising at a rate that is about 10 million times faster than the rate at which we evolved those abilities. That and a, and a number of other calculations lead me to believe that uh, the highest peaks will be covered by this rising flood in less than 50 years. But once the level of computer competence has risen beyond uh, the, best the best human engineers, then there won't be any human engineers. There will be uh, robotic or computer engineers. But what's amazing is that this works at all, ever. That's the really fascinating thing. So it, in these really amazing, like really rather shocking graphs, and what we can see here is, is that as we have more compute and we train larger and larger models, we find this pretty consistent power law that will predict the final performance we will see from these models given the amount of compute we have available. This is pretty amazing. I found this really rather surprising that this was not at all obvious at the time. And I still, to this day, I think people do not realize how important, how fascinating this is that you have these in just purely empirical, these like there's some attempt at theoretical explanation, but ultimately empirical that, uh, you know, observation that as we have bigger models and we give them more compute, they just keep getting better. This means that as models, models become bigger, they actually become more sample efficient. This is kind of crazy. Like I remember when I was taught neural networks, you know, back in the day, I was still taught that, you know, you have to be very careful to use the smallest model possible so that it doesn't overfit your data. But that just seems to be wrong. It just learns things so much more efficiently as the models get larger. A good friend of mine, Leo Gao, put this pretty elegantly in his blog. The thing about GPT-3 that makes it so important is that it provides evidence that as long as we keep increasing the model size, we can keep driving down the loss, possibly right up until it hits the Shannon entropy of text. No need for clever architectures or complex handcrafted heuristics. Just by scaling it up, we can get a better language model and a better language model entails a better world model. This is really hits it on the head why I think the scaling laws are the more interesting part of the GPT-3 paper. If they hit Shannon entropy, that means they perfectly predict everything as well as possible. So they're already a perfect method and know everything there is to know. So far, if we had more computing power, we would predict that models would just continue to get better. No new insights needed, just more computing power, which is kind of yeah, it's kind of weird. And it's it goes very much against a lot of the intuitions that a lot of people in this field have. And you thought this only worked for language? Surprise, it also works for other things. Images, you know, text image, video, math. Here from a follow-up paper here, we can see that you find scaling laws in all of these different tasks. As you just make bigger models and you just put in more compute, you get a bet you get a better model with with very predictable levels of com uh, of performance. This is crazy. This is this is astounding to me. This is a fascinating empirical scientific discovery. I did not predict this. I did not predict that there would be the scaling laws that we could just you know see a power law of performance for all of these very different tasks. But here we are, and I think this is something that is worth exploring. What does this mean? You know, how, how, you know, what can we derive from this? How far can these scaling laws really take us? So uh, I think it's really important to push harder on research because I think there's a lot to do. But then on scale, yeah, scale is really good. Like, you know, when we have built the Dyson sphere around the sun and gotten compute as efficiently as we've gotten it, we can finally say, okay, like, you know, I'm very willing to entertain the discussion then that we should stop scaling. Um, but, but short of that, I, I think there's like, there's no reason that I see right now to not keep pushing really hard on it. By 2032, I don't think you'll know you're talking to a model and not a human. <laughs> I mean, you might, because it'll just be like so much better than any human at helping you out with stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that by 20, I mean, that's a long time at the rate this field is going. I think it'll, mm -hmm. uh, I think it will be remarkable and it will, it, 
yeah, it'll feel like you're just not only talking to your smartest friend, but like thousands of smart friends that are domain experts everywhere you want that are like working at superhuman speed to do whatever you need. Mm -hmm. Like full, full like comprehension of, of language. The, this technology is going to be so influential on the shape of the future that it has to be uh, a society at large participating in a very large conversation about uh, you know, what it is we, we expect the technology to do, like what things should we encourage and what things should we discourage. And I think you need to have both halves of the conversation. Like there's unalloyed good that these uh, pieces of technology can do that will make everyone's life uh, better. Uh, and so, yeah, what, what I would hope is we can have a conversation, uh, you know, and it's, it's government, it's academia, it's industry, it's, uh, yeah, like we, we need everyone to get themselves slightly better educated about what the technology itself is capable of so that, you know, you, you know, your mom and mine and like whomever else wants to have a say in how their future unfolds uh, can participate in this conversation and make smart decisions about, you know, who they're choosing to represent their voice. Um, but like, I, I hope that can be a really rich conversation that balances both the positive and the, and the negative that, uh, that, that we need to be thinking about. This, I agree with everything Kevin said about the need to get the world's input. And that this principle that I hold dear is that the people that are going to be most impacted by technology deserve the most voice in how it's used. And in this case, I think everyone's going to be impacted and it does need to be a, a real global conversation. Um, but how we get everybody to listen to that voice, I don't, I don't know. I hope they do. I've been uh, talking about the need for 1000X more compute or 1000X you know, performance per watt improvement uh, for a little while. Um, in fact, I think it, uh, I talked about it in my hot chips keynote. Uh, and uh, and a few other events as well. The reason is the the demand for that compute already exists today, right? You know, just taking a concrete example of if I want to train one of the interesting neural nets in real time, not in you know minutes, hours, days, right? In real time, the need for that is there today. The demand for it is there today. So in many ways, we got to figure out as a technology industry, and that's the fun of being here, like how do we get there, right? So the Zeta scale is a, you know, kind of a nice numerical way to say it because we have been talking, you know, 10, 10 power 18 with exascale, you know, kind of the 10 power 21. But the essence of, uh, the Zeta scale initiative is the thousand X to me than kind of the current performance per watt baseline. The amount of time it took from, you know, each generation from, you know, the, from Terra to Peta, Peta to uh, Exa, right? Uh, and the timeline we set from Exa to Zeta is actually shorter than the previous transitions. Historically, uh, and this is one of the foundations of Moore's law, was integration with the integration we draw this uh, you know extraordinary kind of you know uh, things where now you have a supercomputer in your pocket uh, uh, in a, in a phone right um, no no reason that aspect of Moore's law needs to stop because there's still an opportunity just even beyond transistor stuff just the integration aspect integration driving um, some order of magnitude efficiencies.